How's it going guys? Welcome back to the Horror Basement. Uh, my name's Shane, and in this video we're going to be continuing our deep dive into the Hills Have Eyes film franchise. In today's video we're going to be talking about The Hills Have Eyes Part 2 from 1984. Now when this movie begins uh, we are treated to a uh, flashback of the basically most of the third act of uh, the first movie. Uh, which was released uh, seven years prior to this back in 1977. So luckily for everyone who did not buy the Betamax, uh, Bobby, the teenage son of uh, the Carter family from the first movie, is recounting the events of that, face, fa that fateful uh, trip into the desert with his therapist, uh, which allows us to recap the events of the first movie. Also in the intermittent seven years, um, between the events of the first movie and this one, Bobby has married Ruby, the daughter of uh, Jupiter, and uh, the basically the slave girl daughter of the desert cannibal family. So Ruby has since changed her name to Rachel to try and distance herself from her past, and um, she is leading a group of roughly seven... Uh, teenaged motocross enthusiasts to a race in the desert uh, where initially Bobby was planning to go with them, but due to his PTSD from the events of the first movie, he's unable to go. So our cast of characters comprises of Ruby slash Rachel, um, roughly seven um, teenaged uh, slasher victims, and Beast, uh, the G German Shepherd that returns uh, from the first movie. Now, unfortunately for our group of characters, uh, they manage to forget that it's daylight savings time and have to take a shortcut through the murder family cannibal desert to try and make it to their race on time. But of course, they experience car trouble and are left stranded at an abandoned um, like mining village. And of course, they begin to very quickly be attacked by the said um, desert murder cannibals, who have been whittled down to just uh, two members for this movie. Uh, Michael Berryman returns as Pluto, and is given a good bit more screen time towards the beginning of the movie, and uh, more speaking roles than he had in the first movie. And the second... Um, murder desert cannibal is the new edition of the reaper a uh, real name unknown the reaper is apparently the older brother of papa jupiter and um he has uh i guess he was out at the 7-eleven buying cigarettes when the first movie took place so he but he's back now and he's in charge and he knows that um he knows that Rachel is Ruby, and he is going to kill all these um, teenage slasher victims and get his revenge on Ruby for abandoning the family. So most of people's complaints about this movie uh, basically boil down to it being more of a by-the-book slasher movie than compared to the kind of like exploitation style of the first one. Uh a lot of people have drawn comparisons between this movie and the Friday the 13th uh, franchise, with basically you are introduced to this introduced to this cavalcade of young happy-go-lucky teenagers that go to a place and then are systematically killed off one by one um, in typical slasher movie fashion, which would I guess make the character of the Reaper um, sand Jason. And not too long, uh, you know, into the movie, um, Pluto ends up getting himself killed uh, by Beast, just like his younger brother Mercury did in the first movie. So for anyone keeping score, uh, most of the desert cannibal family have been taken out by the family dog Beast, who is the goodest boy. And with Pluto out of the way, the rest of the movie uh, turns into your typical slasher third act with the uh, remaining uh, with the remaining uh, couple, uh, Roy, who is the main 
uh, dirt bike racer, and Cass, who is uh, his girlfriend, who is one of those uh, magical blind movie characters who can, like, uh, sense and hear things from, like, miles away because she's blind. Um, they are left uh, as the only survivors to go up against uh, the Reaper, and they end up killing him with the... Uh, with some of Bobby's uh, super secret, supercharged gasoline they use to blow up the uh, family bus and then drop uh, the Reaper down the abandoned mine shaft. So overall, I enjoyed this movie, and I don't really understand um, people's criticism of it. Um, in the intermittent seven years between the first and the second part of The Hills Have Eyes, the horror genre changed a good bit. Um, gone were the kind of, like, gritty, true-to-life exploitation-style films, like The Hills Have Eyes and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and what we now know is the slasher genre had already taken hold. So the way I like to think about it is, and I'll use this um, cow leg as an analogy, what Wes Craven did with this movie is he took the bones of the first movie, like the, the setting, some of the characters, the kind of like general story. He took the bones of that and then built the slasher movie that people wanted at that point around it. And clearly this was a fruitful exercise for Wes Craven because later this year in 1984... Um, he would go on to release A Nightmare on Elm Street and leave his unending mark on the slasher genre as a whole. So while this may seem at points a bit of a cookie-cutter slasher, it's still a well-directed, well-paced, and very enjoyable um, entry into the slasher oeuvre, and I would highly recommend it. That's going to be it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.